Hello, uh, welcome to the class. It's how to attract and raise monarch butterflies. And thank you for taking the time to come and learn more about monarchs and how we can help them. So just to introduce myself, I'm Lura Press and I've lived in the Temecula Murrieta area for about 30 years. And I don't have a degree in botany or science or entomology or anything like that. Um, I actually do accounting. But I do love gardening, um, enjoy wildlife and national parks, uh, doing research and observing nature. So um, actually the way I got into Monarchs was back when we had the shutdown <laughs> this last year in um, about April or May, I just decided to take a little gravel spot that I had on my property and turn it into a butterfly garden. And so I planted, um, some simple flowers that would nectar and enjoyed watching it grow and start blossoming with all different kinds of flowers. And I also planted milkweed, which immediately attracted monarch butterflies to the garden. And they laid eggs and those eggs grew into caterpillars, which formed a chrysalis like this. And then when I watched them emerge as butterflies, it was so um, such an interesting experience. And so by doing all that, that's why I really got interested then in promoting education and also cooperation so that we can help monarchs and other endangered butterflies. So here's a picture of a butterfly and just most people are familiar with uh, the monarch. It's probably one of the most well-known butterflies in North America. It's such a beautiful, um, distinctive uh, pattern that it has. And it also has an incredible life story just to see how it goes from an egg right there on the bottom of a leaf, on the underside of a leaf, to a little newly hatched um, caterpillar. And then it grows as it's eating that plant, that's the milkweed plant. And then it forms this beautiful chrysalis with these golden spots on it. And now with the wings visible through that clear case, and finally a, a newly emerged butterfly who then goes and finds a mate and finds some milkweed to lay more eggs on. And then they start that whole process all over again. That whole process takes about 30 days. So that life cycle is, is amazing just to be able to observe that. But the other thing that's interesting is their migration. Um, in the United States, there's two different uh, distinct populations that migrate. There's the Eastern migrators and also the Western uh, migrators. And then there's also a third group that do not migrate um, and they, um, are found in different parts of the Southern United States. But let's start with the Eastern migration. These uh, butterflies, they spend their winters down here in Mexico from about October through February or March. And they are huddled together in trees in a forest in Mexico. And then in the springtime, they head back North through Texas and here they lay eggs and then those butterflies die. They've been alive for the whole winter. So the, their eggs that they laid, you know, become caterpillars, they become um, butterflies and then they fly up farther, lay eggs. And so it's about three or four generations as they progressively move to the east and to the north. And then that last generation, they get up here um, about August or September, those ones that emerge, they, instead of laying eggs, they turn around and they fly all the way back down to that same forest in Mexico that their great grandparents were in. So they, it's a completely different butterfly, but they're able to navigate their way back to that same forest and often the same trees um, that their ancestors were on. It's a long journey, 2,500, 3,000 miles for a little butterfly to go. Okay, um, so that's the Eastern migration. Now, 
the Western monarchs, they spend their winters here along the coast of California, from San Francisco all the way down to Mexico. Um, and in the springtime, then they journey back to locations in these areas that are west of the Rocky Mountains. And they go all the way up to Canada. And then those, uh, when they, the last generation there in the late summer, then they turn around and then they come back again to the coast. Now I mentioned there's a third population of non-migrating monarchs that live year round in different locations. There's some in Southern California and then here in Texas along the Gulf Coast and then also in Florida. And those populations, um, they just continue to lay eggs and to live year round. So there could be maybe 11 or 12 generations um, each year of those non-migrating populations. So the reason it's good to know about this is that each of these populations, they have different needs and at different times of the year. And so in order to help the monarchs, we kind of need to know what's happening in our area and know what, what they need um, at that time. Now, where I live is, um, like I said, Temecula Murrieta, so it's Southern California. Well, this has been an ideal location for monarchs for, for a long, long time. And it's because there's an abundance of open land that used to be covered with milkweed. Um, and there's plenty of trees. Butterflies need to have trees uh, for shelter from the wind. Um, and then there's also plenty of lakes and streams here. This is uh, hot springs that are in Murrieta that um, are a shelter actually for some of the, um, the butterflies in our area. And then of course we have plenty of wildflowers. This is just south of Temecula. So the conditions are ideal or were ideal for a long time. This um, chart though shows, and probably you've heard that um, the population of the monarchs sadly is uh, dropping. In fact, they're almost close to extinction. Um, this chart shows the Western monarchs and this is the Thanksgiving count. So every year at Thanksgiving, there's volunteers that uh, go out to about 250 different locations in California that are known to um, where the monarchs overwinter and so they go out to those places and with binoculars and a little notepad, they take notes of how many butterflies that they see in each of those locations. And then they tally it all up, send it back here to this monarch watch. Um, so actually this, yeah, this is the Xerxes Society that does this count. So back in 1997, you can see that the amount was about 1,200,000, but it started dropping drastically that next year. And then you can see it's just gone up and down since then. In 2018 and 2019, there was less than 30,000 monarchs in all of California for this yearly count. And that's just so low in comparison to the millions that there were back in the 80s and in the early 90s. Um, but then we come here to this last year, just a few months ago in uh, 2020, Thanksgiving, um, they counted 1,900 monarchs in all of California of, in these uh, overwintering sites. So it's very, very critical. Um, the numbers are showing that, that the migrating population definitely is declining. It's just about at extinction. So the question comes up, why? What's happened over the years? Well, it turns out that uh, monarchs need milkweed. And this shows the monarch butterfly's life cycle. And there's an adult uh, butterfly and it lays eggs on milkweed. And then those eggs hatch into caterpillars and those caterpillars can only eat milkweed leaves. Um, and then they go on and form a chrysalis. The chrysalis becomes a new, turns into a butterfly. And once again, then they've got to go and find milkweed again. And we used to have milkweed everywhere um, in our, 
in the open lands, it just grew abundantly. But unfortunately, as time has gone by, um, as we've built homes and built our cities, um, we have not put that milkweed back again. We plant plants that we get, you know, at, at the local stores, at the local nurseries that, you know, we think are beautiful, but we are we need to put back the milkweed that the butterflies need, especially the monarchs. That's their, it's called their host plant. And it's that, um, it's called a host because it hosts their babies. It's what they lay their eggs on and it's what their, of the baby caterpillars can eat. Okay, so that's where we can help. Um, this is a milkweed plant that I planted from seed. And this is about eight to 10 weeks after um, it was planted. And you can see it's already a beautiful plant. It's flowering and it's got plenty of leaves, enough to feed a caterpillar. So it, it's not difficult to do this. It's something that really all of us can do. Um, and this can make a huge difference. So it doesn't mean we have to plant the whole yard in milkweed, but you know, if uh, if we can at least have one milkweed in our yard, and if, if not, then maybe more, um, it can really make a difference for the monarchs. So let's go on now then and talk a little bit about the uh, life cycle of the monarchs. And I just might add, you know, besides helping the monarchs, it's really interesting to watch them grow. So we are so busy with our lives and we often forget to take note of, you know, the little creatures and all the things that are going on in our yard and in our area. But it's, this is a wonderful opportunity to just kind of take some time to, to notice um, what amazing creatures they are. So let's start in there, uh, see what, what it is that they need and how we can help them. Okay, if they could talk, that's what they would be asking you. Could you please plant a milkweed? Okay, so the monarch, this is their life cycle. And um, it just gives you an idea that they're from egg, from the adult laying the egg all the way till the, the next um, adult butterfly. It's about a month, about 30 days. So they're in that egg stage for about three to five days. They're in the larva or caterpillar stage for nine to 14 days, chrysalis for about eight to 13 days. And then the adult lives for about, about a month. Now this is all temperature dependent though. So if it's um, warmer, like if it's the chart shows here, if it's 83 degrees Fahrenheit, this whole process can be done in about 20 days. But if it's down to 72 degrees, then it might take about 32 days. Um, so you'll notice changes depending on what season that you're in. And this shows just how long each um, generation lives. And it's interesting because that first generation, the ones that are born in the spring, so they live, you know, maybe if they emerge in April, they might live to May and then they lay, lay eggs. So that next generation might live about a month, the next generation about a month, but that fourth generation that come out, like I said, around August or September, they actually live for like eight to nine months. They, they live all the way through their fall migration while they're flying back to wherever it is they go. And then they are in a state called diapause where they're not laying eggs. All they do is just basically huddle in trees, try to stay warm. Um, when they need to, they go down and find nectar and then go back up in the trees and rest. And they're just waiting for the spring. So, um, as for, for the migrating monarchs, like I said, they, their uh, lifespan will depend on what time of year it is. Okay, um, the caterpillars go through five different instars or stages, and you can see they start out very tiny. And with each stage, um, their markings get more striking and more colorful. And then also these antenna that they have on the front of their on their head and also down by their tail with each stage it gets a little bit longer so it turns out you can kind of tell what stage they're in just by the length of their antenna their how much they can eat changes a lot too when they're little they just eat very just a tiny little pinhead amount uh, maybe in this stage they can eat maybe the size of a dime out of a, a little hole in the leaf 
Um, this one, they might eat a, a few leaves up here. They might eat five or six leaves, but the last stage, they can eat like 12 to 15 leaves. Um, and that's actually one of the issues that we have with, um, with the monarchs because, because we have so little milkweed, a lot of times uh, the mom will lay quite a few eggs on one plant instead of just one egg on each plant. And so the little ones, you know, you can maybe have 10 caterpillars on one plant and they do fine at this stage, this stage and this stage, but once they get up here, they run out of food and um, they will starve before they can even get either here or before they can turn into a butterfly. So let's see here. This shows the first milkweed um, that I actually purchased. I bought it at a, um, a local store um, and put it in the yard. And just within about an hour or a couple hours of putting it out there, a monarch flew by and started laying eggs on it. And it's interesting that they can actually smell milkweed from a long ways away. And so they will seek out, if you put milkweed in your yard, they will um, try to come and, and find it. Um, so here it is, it's on that plant, laying eggs and, and also uh, nectaring. And then if you look on the underside of the leaves, that's where you can see the little eggs, these little white spots all over. So there's a picture of the underside of the leaves, each of them with a little egg on it. And it starts out, it's cream colored, but then one little end of the egg, well, the egg starts to stretch out. It starts to look almost like a, like a little piece of dried rice, but one end will be black. And that's because the little caterpillar inside there has a black head. And so you can see on this one, he's um, eaten his way out of the egg and just newly emerged. And then this one, um, it hasn't um, emerged yet. And so as far as how quickly they grow, you can see this one is newly emerged and it's about two millimeters long. And in just a short time there, that one's about four millimeters. There's one about six millimeters. You can see the little antenna are getting longer. There, that one is almost, what, 20 millimeters. That one's over 30, getting uh, much bigger. And then this one's over 40 millimeters. So they, they grow very, very quickly. And that's because they have a big appetite as they're growing. And it's uh, interesting to watch them just, uh, they can devour a whole leaf in just a very short amount of time by the time they're at this stage. So your milkweed that starts off looking like this with several caterpillars all over it, in a short time, it looks like that. And don't be alarmed because that is a good thing. It means that uh, it, that's what the plant is for. It's supposed to be their food, but it's really important to have more fresh milkweed to be able to give them. So um, when you are helping the monarchs, that's one of the most important things is if you possibly can, you'll want to learn how to grow milkweed. It's not hard to grow from seed. Um, and um, you want to have plenty for them to be able to eat. Okay, when they're done eating, they go into the stage called a jayhang. And um, this one is in a cage that I have. Um, and it's got a clear plastic side on it. And so it just happened to be crawling along that plastic and we were I was able to see, you know, with the sun hitting it right, how as it's crawling along, it's just making this beautiful web um, the whole way. And then it, when it finds the spot that it wants to stay in, then it'll make a little silk button there and then it'll attach itself and hang upside down um, to, until it forms into a chrysalis. Okay, there's the little cage that I had it in. And um, you can see it's got mesh on all the sides and then just one side's got the clear side so you can easily observe what's going on inside. Okay, so this is uh, again doing the J hang and you can see there that little silk button that it's formed. And 
again there, what they do is they put their back legs up into that silk button and just hang on tight. And you can see it there too with its little legs up there and into that button. And then after, I think it's about 18 hours that it hangs like that. And pretty soon it's gonna form the chrysalis. What it does is it sheds that skin, that dark skin one more time. And it wriggles almost like taking a turtleneck sweater off. So it just wriggles and the skin goes up to the top. And this happens pretty quickly, just probably in about four or five minutes. The um, skin goes up there to the top and then it falls off. And the little chrysalis is hanging there. And it continues to wriggle around because that little stem right there at the top, it's called its cremaster, um, it has to hook that into that silk uh, button and almost like a corkscrew. And then in a short time, the little chrysalis, it uh, dries and it, it turns into that beautiful green, jade green color. And then it will hang there for about 10 days. Now this one formed its chrysalis on the bottom of a leaf. And it's that's not a great place because if another caterpillar comes along and eats the leaf, obviously the chrysalis will fall to the ground. Um, so once in a while you do have to move the chrysalis um, to a safer location. But usually when they make the chrysalis, they usually will climb to the top of the cage and make it up there in a nice safe spot. If they're not in a cage, if they're out in the wild, then they will try to find a, um, a branch on a, you know, a tree or a bush that's nearby. Maybe they'll climb over to a lawn chair and try to attach to that. Um, as far as keeping them safe, it's kind of nice to have them in the cage because you can kind of keep track of where they are and um, be able to even watch the whole process. Okay, so then, like I said, they're in that chrysalis for about 10, 11 days, depending on the temperature. And then right before um, it's going to emerge, the day before, you'll start seeing the lines very faintly underneath the marking of the butterfly. And then pretty soon you can see the color, that orange coloring underneath, and some of the spots are starting to show through. And then that next morning, it looks like this. It's completely clear and you can see the butterfly waiting to come out. Um, this case is amazing uh, that it's in. It, there's four parts to it. There's a front part here that's short, and then there's two side parts here. And then this back piece is um, kind of like a J shape, and it's got a little cup at the bottom there. But I'm going to try to zoom in here and see if I can just show you on the seams. They have little, um, it's almost like <laughs> it's glued together or it's a zipper because it can come apart very slowly. Um, so as the butterfly begins pushing its way out, you'll see it start to open. But like I said, it's slowly because the butterfly cannot just fall down. Um, it will, um, it wouldn't be able to fly. If it falls and its wings get bent while they're wet and then it dries that way, it, it wouldn't be able to fly. So it's really important for it to be able to hang on for dear life and just come straight down, let its wings hang down until it's done, um, till the wings are dry. Okay, so here is gonna be a picture of it emerging and it it looks kind of ugly right when it first comes out the wings are all wet the abdomen is really uh, swollen and the wings are all crinkled but then pretty soon all that fluid gets pumped from the abdomen into the wings and in a very short time um, it, you can see the wings are straightening out they're still a little crinkly at the bottom but now they're getting straighter there and up here you can see it's little it's proboscis and that's, it's um, like a straw that it's gonna use to drink nectar. Okay, so when it first comes out, it's about 25 millimeters long. It's about the size of my thumb. And then a chest about 
15 minutes later, now it's down to being almost 60 uh, millimeters. So it's really neat to sit and just watch their wings as they expand and as they straighten out. Okay, and then they're just beautiful, the little markings that they have. And then this picture, it shows their little proboscis here, and you can see how it's in two parts. Um, it's like a straw that's been cut right down the middle lengthwise. And so they actually take their little mandibles, almost like uh, it's not hands, but uh, they pat their two mandibles together with a straw in the middle of it. And it's like they're, they're uh, kind of knitting it together. Okay, so now these three emerged all in the same morning. You can see them in the front there, and then you can see the ones in the back. There's one, two, three, four that are going to emerge, you know, another day. And they're drying their wings. And then pretty soon they're able to start flapping their wings and also crawling around um, inside the cage. It, they just need some time to, to kind of get all... Uh, situated there. Their vision is becoming clear and then their control of the wings and of their legs uh, gets better. Okay, here's how you can tell a boy from a girl. So the male on their bottom wings, because they have four wings, so there's their top wings, but on their bottom wings, they have very thin veins and then they have this spot uh, on each wing. And so that's different. The females have thicker veins and they don't have the spot. The spot is actually um, produces a hormone um, to attract the girls. Okay, so here's the female and you can see those um, veins are very thick and there's no spot. Okay, so now I'm planting a butterfly garden. Um, it's really not, it doesn't have to be anything uh, super complicated. You can do, as simple as planting one milkweed flower. The, not only is it the host plant that the caterpillars need, but it also provides nectar. Um, so just that one simple thing, you can actually start attracting uh, monarchs to your yard. Now, of course, it's better if you plant more um, or if you have more because the, um, this would just support one caterpillar. And so if you wanna be able to raise more or help more, um, you'll want to have more plants than that. Now, as you can see, this is just my little garden, but it's nice to have um, also nectaring flowers or different types of flowers that attract butterflies. So this is lantana, and I've also got some sage in there. Um, the, the flowers that I picked were ones that would uh, flower at different seasons. So some in the spring, summer, some in the fall, some in the winter. Um, so you can really do anything that you want as far as flowers. You can um, go online and just look up what flowers grow well in your area and which ones attract butterflies. Um, but just remember that when you're attracting butterflies with these different types of flowers, that's only for the adults to be able to eat. But if you want to help the monarchs with their babies in order to, to have the next generation, you have to plant milkweed because that's the only plant um, that they their babies use. Okay, so there's different varieties of milkweed that you can plant. Um, in our area, uh, tropical milkweed grows really well. And it's one that grows year round. And it's very easy to start from seed. And in my case, I've tried different types and they do prefer the tropical. Um, now it does have to be trimmed back to every December um, to promote new growth and also to avoid a buildup of a parasite that's called OE that has been found to be harmful to monarchs. Now there's a lot of controversy about this particular type of uh, milkweed and some people say, oh, you should rip it out of your yards and not grow it at all. Um, but there's other um, articles that recognize the importance of tropical milkweed. 
And many people in our area who have successfully raised monarchs, they have found that the tropical milkweed is very useful um, for their needs. So if you just know how to either cut it back, um, in my case, I've been using it and I do test my um, butterflies for that OE parasite. And out of the 36 last um, butterflies that I've released, just one out of those 36 had the OE parasite, all the rest are clear. So, and they've all been raised on tropical milkweed. So if you are careful about the way that you use it, it's not a problem at all. Now there are other types of milkweed too that are um, useful that can be grown in our area, um, but they don't grow from about October till about March or April. So um, especially for those of us that live in an area where there's a year round population, it's vital to have tropical milkweed available for them. If we were to totally remove the tropical milkweed, we would be harming the year round populations that are living in our area. And because the migrating ones are declining, you certainly don't wanna be harming the year round population. Um, so anyway, so that's just in a, in a nutshell, um, there, you can do more research on that. I do have a website, um, press butterfly gardens, and I have links on there under the frequently asked questions section, um, to articles that you can look up and read from, um, different entomologists that explain why the, they feel that tropical milkweed is valuable. Okay, so, but as far as other types of milkweed, there's, um, there's one that's called uh, butterfly weed, which is useful. It's um, really good for our area. There's also a narrow leaf milkweed. That one does spread. So you just need to know that um, if you don't mind having milkweed that just keeps popping up all over your yard, that, that would be one that would be good. But if you want ones that are well-behaved, you would wanna use the tropical milkweed um, or showy milkweed or the butterfly uh, milkweed. Okay, and there's other varieties too. There's, um, there's so many varieties of it. It's just hard to find seeds for them and also find the full grown plants. But hopefully as more and more of us are growing more milkweed, we can um, have more available for others. Okay, so now this just briefly goes over how to grow milkweed from seeds. And I just get potting soil um, and I put it into a, you know, a tray. This is a 10 by 10 tray. I moisten the soil. I sprinkle the seeds on and then put a little bit more soil over them. And then I just, uh, I keep it moist and I cover it um, so that the moisture, you know, stays in. And also I don't want it to be exposed to light. And I do that for about a week. And each day I take the cover off, check it. Um, spray the, the stop of, top of the soil again. And after about seven to nine days, these little seedlings will start sprouting out. And, um, and then as soon as the second leaves come out, then I just take those little seedlings and I put them into individual cups. I like to use Dixie cups that have holes drilled in the bottom of them, um, just because I'm trying to raise quite a few and it's easier for me to keep all of these covered and in a, in a good um, location, you know, as far as the right amount of light, the right amount of humidity until they get a little bit bigger. Um, these ones are ones I started from seed and this is eight weeks after I started them from seed. They were grown indoors by this sunny south facing window. And you can see they already, they're already blooming. They're really good size. Those ones um, actually were past the point where I could have planted them into um, little half gallon containers or pots. Okay, so there's my tray full of seedlings. And I just, all I do is just start taking them out and very carefully separating them. You can put, you can actually put two together in a pot if you want to, but um, they have very long um, roots already and you don't want to disturb the roots. So whatever you need to do, um, just very gently, you can put them each into the little hole of potting soil and fill it in with dirt around it. And there you go. 
And so then this just shows, these are the ones that I've uh, put into the little Dixie cups. And in a few weeks, they're at this size. And once they're that big, you, I can put them into like a little half gallon pot. And then I let them grow there till they're much, you know, more bushy and they're blooming. And then at that point, they're ready to, to feed to caterpillars. Okay, and then back here, you can see these ones here, I have already fed these to some of my caterpillars and they were eaten down just as stalks, but now they're growing back again. So even after your milkweed has been eaten down, it will get new leaves. It takes about, uh, oh, about six weeks, maybe six to eight weeks, and then it's, it's all full again and ready for the next batch um, of caterpillars. Okay, and then that just shows you, there's my little butterfly garden out there in the corner, but then over here is where I have uh, all my own little nursery where I'm growing plants. So really anybody can um, help just by getting one milkweed plant, putting it in your yard. You can also help by getting um, a, one of those little cages, a butterfly cage that definitely will protect your um your um, caterpillars as they're growing. And then if you're able to learn how to grow from seed, that's a huge help too, because you'll be able to share milkweed with other people um, and you'll have plenty you know, for your own uh, needs as well. Okay, so avoiding common problems. Um, my first batch of caterpillars, um, they were just doing really well on my plant and I had the plant out in the yard and I went out a couple hours later and checked on it and all the caterpillars were gone. Even the eggs and caterpillars were different stages. You know, there was young ones and there was some that were getting, you know, bigger um, and they were all gone. And so either a bird came by or a lizard or something got them all. So um, that's one thing that you, it, in nature, if you just leave your plant out in the open, um, they say about one in a hundred caterpillars will make it to the adult butterfly stage. That's terrible odds. So um, if you are able to, it's nice to get a little um, cage like this. They come as you can get them as cheap as like $8 on Amazon and, um, or depending if you want to get a larger one, I think this one was like $25, but um, it's, it is helpful. It's something that you would use again and again, if you are interested in raising a caterpillar all the way to an adult. Um, here's another thing, when too many caterpillars are on one plant, if the big ones are there and there's little ones, they can accidentally eat the little ones. Um, and so if you have an option, if you have several plants, it's a good idea to put the big ones on one plant and the little ones on a different plant um, just for their protection. And then of course, it's good to have extra milkweed growing um, so that you don't run out of food. Um, another thing that's important is to have milkweed that has not been treated with pesticides. Um, I mentioned how my first batch of caterpillars were eaten by a bird. Well, the next batch, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they were eating and growing and then they got sick. And, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't um, that parasite, but it turns out it was because the milkweed is treated with pesticides when you buy them from like a big store, like maybe Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that. Um, and other nurseries also, um, sometimes they are not in control of what's happening with the small nursery or whatever nursery it was that raised the milkweed. So they may not know that it's been sprayed. Um, it is a challenge to raise milkweed um, without pesticides. So it, um, it does take a little bit extra work. I actually grow it in uh, some of these cages as well, especially when it's real tiny because aphids will eat it. So um, I can see why some, the larger nurseries just, you know, they would use pesticides, but it's really important for the health of the caterpillars and, and the butterflies that um, we use milkweed that has not been treated. So that's why I started growing um, pesticide-free milkweed. I do offer it for sale here in Murrieta. And there's also another um, place down in San Diego. It's called 
Butterfly Farms, and they also offer milkweed that is pesticide free. There's probably other places that I don't know of yet, but um, make sure you make the effort to, to be able to do, to get clean milkweed. When the caterpillars get to that last instar, that large, the largest stage, if you do not have milkweed anymore, at that stage, they can eat butternut squash. Um, and you just take fresh butternut squash, you slice it, I put it on a popsicle stick, and then I just put it where they are able to reach it from the plant. Um, and you can see they've eaten, this one's eaten this plant clean, but he still needs to grow, still needs to eat for another day or two. And so the butternut squash can help you get over that last um, little hurdle there if you don't have enough milkweed for it. You cannot raise them from when they're little on that. Those first four stages, they need the nutrients that are in milkweed in order to, um, to be healthy. I've heard some people say that um, if they started them too soon on this, that the wings came out like crinkled or deformed and they never straightened out. So I've never had that happen, but I've, I've never fed them that young um, on butternut squash. So again, that's the fifth instar that you would feed butternut squash if you need to. There's another decimated milkweed plant. Okay, one other issue that um, happens with, um, with the caterpillars is there's a fly, it's called a tachnid fly, and it comes and it lays its eggs on the plant and also on the caterpillars. Um, and so one way to get around that issue is as soon as you see eggs on your milkweed plant, you can take the whole plant and then just put it inside that, the cage, um, that netted cage as well. Um, other, another way you can do it, you can just go out and collect the leaves um, that have the eggs on them. And so I did try that and you just collect them. I put them on a paper towel and then pretty soon those eggs hatch and you have the little, um, the little caterpillars. And then I just feed them fresh leaves each day. Um, you you put, actually just put them like, okay, there's an old leaf right there that I cut. It has the egg around it. And then I put that whole thing on a fresh leaf. And that way, when the little caterpillar comes out, it can just crawl right over and eat, you know, some of that fresh. Um, I started doing that because I had a lot of people that were buying milkweed and they had never raised a caterpillar before. And since I was getting so many eggs in my area and they weren't, um, I was sharing um, caterpillars with them so that they could have that experience. And also so that we wouldn't have to uh, just dispose of these eggs and baby caterpillars. Okay, and then of course, after they reach um, their full adult size, they, when they emerge as adults, then um, you can set them free. And I like to give them a little bit of nectar from a flower. Just put them out either on my daisies or just anywhere in your garden where there's flowers, I like to put them there and then they will fly away. Okay, I'm gonna pause this for a minute and then bring up some videos. Okay, so um, I showed earlier some of the milkweed that I'd grown from seed. So this is them. Uh, now I put them into these little half gallon containers and then put them outside. And as soon as I put them outside, uh, a monarch flew into my yard and started laying eggs on them. So it's milkweed is definitely a monarch magnet. And you'll see she's visiting each plant and then laying an egg on each plant. When there's plenty of milkweed, they generally only lay one or two eggs on each plant, which is ideal. When there isn't a lot, they can eight, lay, you know, 20 eggs on a plant and there's no way that, you know, the plant is gonna be able to support that many. Okay, this is some milkweed that I had cut down back to the stalks, but this little mama, she still knew this was milkweed. And so she's gonna lay an egg right about here, right where I'm pointing, just look there, a little white spot. You really have to know what you're looking for when you're looking for the eggs, because they're very tiny. And then this is an egg 
and the little caterpillar inside has a black cap or like a black head and you can see it moving and it's because it's chewing its way out of that egg. And so that's how you know it's going to emerge. I had to take a um, my microscope and then I just put my cell phone <laughs> right on top of the microscope and was able to see that because it's pretty small. Same thing here. It's there's the egg on this side and there's the little caterpillar. It just crawled out. It has a little piece of the egg right there on his head. Okay, this one is a little bit older. It's the next stage. You can tell because it's got some the little antennas. And that's about how much they can eat at that size, just about the size of a dime. And then here's a larger caterpillar on that plant. So I've got a large one there. And then on the next plant, you'll see that there's a smaller one. And when it sheds its skin, when it has to molt in between the different instars, it will find a place, usually on the edge of the cup or on, um, on your plant. It'll just crawl away sometimes off the plant. And it has to lay still there until its new skin you know, is there and, and it, the new skin dries. There's one, he crawled off of that plant and went up the side and you can see he's getting ready to do that J hang. So if you do have several plants, you will see caterpillars at different stages of development. And you can see I put a popsicle stick there from the plant straight over to the side of the cage so that it doesn't have to crawl all over the place. And you want to keep the cage clean, and keep the caterpillars, if you can, from you know crawling through their uh, the poop that's on the bottom of their plant there. Okay, there's another one just about done eating and another one too. So they will be still for periods of time that, you know, they'll eat and then they'll rest. And especially if they're in that stage where they're going to be shedding their skin and um, doing what they call the molting, uh, you never want to move them when they're molting. And I try to never touch them. Um, of course, I always wash my hands, you know, before I'm doing anything in the cage. Um, but I just, I try not to, we have, there's perfume on our hand lotion and it's better if there's as little chemicals as possible for the for the caterpillars. Okay, uh, this one you can just see they have got quite an appetite and they can just eat away. It's pretty interesting to watch them just devour. So this is the stage where you will be running out of milkweed unless you either have butternut squash available or you know you've grown extra milkweed for them. And here we have two eating at the same time on a, on a plant. And I just love the way it seems that their antenna are somehow attached to their jaws. Because every time they take a bite, their little antennas wiggle. Okay, after they're done eating, then um, they're no longer interested in the leaves. And they start crawling around and stretching all over like that. Um, and what it is, is they're looking for a high spot. They're looking for a high branch or something where they can um, go and safely make their chrysalis. So they will crawl all over the plant and then crawl all around the edge of your pot. Or if they're in the ground, then they'll just go crawling off, you know, try to, try to find a bush or a tree or something that they can uh, hang from. They're very vulnerable, of course, as caterpillars because they can't get away from predators. And then a, while they are in that chrysalis stage, they are also vulnerable. So um, if possible, it's good to have them in a cage uh, where they'll be protected. This is just showing how if they are in a cage and when they're done, they'll just crawl up the side of the cage. And this one just went straight up and then found a little place up at the top to start making that silk button and it'll do the J hang pretty soon. And then after, this is after they form chrysalis, they'll just each find their own little spot. It's 
good if they're not, like I said, if their side of the chrysalis is not touching anything. You can see here, there's chrysalises at the top, there's big caterpillars down there. And then over here, just in a separate cage, I just have littler, the smaller caterpillars. So I like to keep them separate. And then over here is where I, I just keep the eggs separate from the caterpillars. So the caterpillars don't eat the eggs. Um, but of course, yeah, and then there's just some eggs. Um, of course, you don't have to do all that. You can even just have a milkweed plant out in your garden. You know, not everyone's going to want to do all this. Um, I was just trying to see, I wanted to learn about them and take pictures and uh, just see what their life cycle was like. So this is the um, caterpillar spinning a web and you can see the thread coming out of something close to its mouth there. So that was kind of interesting to see how they, they just make this trail as they go along. And then pretty soon they, uh, they, they stop in a certain spot and they'll make that silk button. Okay, here it is spinning that silk button and you can see that they just pull it tight. Then they go back down, he wraps it around, he or she, they wrap it around and then they use their little hands to guide it. And then they pull it up again tight, just like if you were sewing with a needle and then pulling it tight. It's pretty incredible. They spend a lot of time making this silk button, but of course it's going to have to anchor them um, if they're outside in wind or rain or whatever, you know, so it has to be a real strong um, spot there for, for them to hang from. Okay, here's one emerging. And you'll see first that the little abdomen has to plop out. And that way it's out of the ways, out of the way of those wings. And then, yep. And then there's the little wings there. And here you can see the proboscis and look at how it's padding it already. And hanging on, it's able to hang on to that uh, case. Okay, so this one's coming out more slowly. I did this in slow motion and you'll be able to see that this front piece is short. The case, uh, the front is short so that the abdomen will be able to flop out first. The sides are longer, so it holds the wings up and then releases them one at a time. And that way they can dry. And since they're wet, you know, you wouldn't want your wings sticking together and they need to separate so that they can dry separately. And the back piece there is cup shape and you can see how it uses that with its legs to hold on and to hang on while all of this is happening. So that case is just a perf perfectly designed packaging um, so that this butterfly has all the chance of success. Okay, and here are those, it's using its two little mandibles to tap, to pat the uh, proboscis together. Little furry fuzzy things. Okay, and then this just shows right after it's uh, come out and the wings are, they're still crinkled, but I just love the color. It's this golden orange on the outside and then inside that deeper red orange just they're just gorgeous okay so this is the first day it's just a few hours after it's emerged and you can see that it is taking two steps forward one step back it's not real coordinated yet and trying to flap the wings at the same time that it's walking so there's a lot to learn in that first day and uh, some people have said it's probably better if you're able to to hold on to them till that second day before you release them if you are um, you, if you have them in a cage if they're out in the wild um, they'll just do the best they can um, but there's a real good chance they could be caught by a predator before they get this all 
you know, together. So, um, and then you're able to set them free. So again, here, I usually don't touch them um, at all, um, except for when I set them free. And of course you'd have washed hands, but I also have started testing them. And so in order to do the testing on each butterfly, I do have to um, touch them just before, you know, in order to take a sample from their abdomen with a piece of tape and then just to check for the spores, uh, you know, under my microscope. So, but other than that, you can just set them out there on your, uh, on a flower and then they will fly away. And yep, I think that's pretty much it. This just shows my growing from seeds. You know, I have these little 10 by 10 trays with covers, plastic covers, or else you can use um, tin foil. There's different seeds you can get. Some of them you can get at livemonarch.com and you can get about, I don't know, 50 or 100 seeds for a couple of dollars. It's one of the best places to get milkweed seeds, um, but you can also get them online. There's blood flower, which is the tropical. That was the butterfly milkweed as well. Um, and then I, like I said, I do keep these plastic covers on just to keep the seeds humid. And then you can see they're in a sunny window, mainly for the warmth um, first, you know, when I'm trying to get them to germinate. Um, and then afterwards, after they do come up like that, then yes, I do want to have them. I want to keep it humid, but they need light at that point. So um, and then those ones just have their first leaves, so they're not ready to transplant yet, but in a few more days, um, when they get that second set of leaves is when I would go ahead and transplant them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when they, when they haven't germinated yet or when they're just starting, I, I do keep them covered and dark. And then over here, it just shows, uh, I just take some Dixie cups and drill holes in the bottom of them and then just put potting soil in there. And I like to use the Dixie cups because milkweed does have a very long uh, root. And so you wanna be able to let that root have room to grow. And then I just use spray bottles to, to do that. So, okay, I think that's it for those. So I'm gonna start stop the screen sharing here. And um, so thank you so much for uh, coming to the class. And um, if you do have any more questions, um, feel free to um, email me through my website. It's pressbutterflygardens.com. And what we're trying to do in this area is just trying to plant more milkweed. So anybody that is in a position to um, get seeds and get them started, um, I do offer plants for sale and also I have seedlings um, that, you know, they're already about four inches tall. So if you don't want to have to buy a whole plant, then come and just buy the, one of the seedlings um, that's already been started. But this is something that um, if all of us just try to work on together, we can really um, make a difference for the monarchs by putting the milkweed back that they need and that has, that used to be here all the time. Okay, well, thanks for coming and um, appreciate your time.